In this tutorial, we're going to take a look at some new material functions, or rather updates, to some material functions in Blender 4.0 that improve on those functionalities from previous versions of Blender. Specifically, we're going to take a look at subsurface scattering, and we're also going to look at the new Sheen model. So let's take a look down here at our Materials panel. And we're going to note that things look a little bit different because they've been reorganized compared to the way they were in 3.6. So we're going to take a look first at subsurface scattering. And we're going to note that the way that they've reorganized this makes sense because they've moved some of the very core basic material functions up to the top of the panel. So just for easy, quick access. Now, right underneath that is subsurface scattering. And that's what we're going to look at. If you tried to use it in versions prior, it seemed a little bit frustrating. You could play around with the values, and it was a little bit hard to relate what you were adjusting to the scene. Well, that's actually one of the big changes that's been made. The subsurface scale is now relative to the scene's scale. So when you're setting a value here, you know exactly how it should relate to the scene. So in my material tester, I've got a ground here where I've got these squares that are common measurements, one centimeter, one inch, a quarter inch, 10 centimeters, so that when you're using it, you can use these as a reference for setting, for instance, the subsurface scale. So let's actually compare what was happening in 3.6 with what's now happening in 4.0, because the input parameters look similar, but there are some changes. If we look at 3.6, there is a subsurface entry, and there's also a subsurface color entry. In 4.0, there's also a subsurface entry, but there's no subsurface color entry. That color entry has been removed, and it now simply uses the base color for the subsurface color, which actually to me makes a lot of sense. It makes it more coherent with the actual material that you're setting. Even though we now see subsurface in 3.6 and subsurface in 4.0, they now have different functions. Subsurface in 3.6 is now transferred to subsurface scale in 4.0. And there we can see 0.5 m for meters, because I happen to have my scene units set to meters. And that is the a direct conversion for what we saw here. But you never had a sense for what that was. It was a static value, regardless of what the scene's units was set to. But now in 4.0, if my units happen to be in imperial inches, this value would show 19.7 inches. The great thing is, you can also just type in a value in a different unit system, and it would automatically put that in and convert it. So the new subsurface value is simply a scalar function. It's nice because now we can just simply take it and scale it back and it'll attenuate the strength of the subsurface effect on your object. It's, it's really quite user friendly. Now the subsurface radius, these correspond to R, G, B. So these are just simply scalar values for each of the R, G, B channels. The subsurface IOR is really one of the values that you're going to work with the very least. It really, from my experimentation, has some of the least effect, and you can just honestly leave it at its default value. Subsurface anisotropy is a way of biasing the direction of the scattering effect either toward or away from the light. Otherwise, the scattering happens in sort of a uniform pattern. So let's come back into the main scene and actually see what this looks like as we play with it. When we look at this, we can see that I have two centimeters. So let's make this more relatable by coming down to scene. And if I change this, we're in metric, I change this to centimeters. Then when I come back to the material, subsurface scale has been changed to two centimeters. So very relatable. Uh, in fact, if I want to, then let's come back because I'm used, to, I'm, I'm in the United States and I know Imperial does not make as much sense as metric, <laughs> but it's what I'm used to working with. So I'm going to reset this to inches. And again, we're going to see that Blender now just takes that value and converts it into 0.787. So that's, that's the maximum depth that the scattering essentially happens. Now, if I want this to be turned on, we have to take the subsurface value and simply drive it up to one. And now we see that taking place. It's got a slightly greenish hint to it, 
and it's also pretty bright. So this is where we can come into the subsurface radius and make adjustments to that to change sort of the tonality of that subsurface as it's happening. So for instance, R, G, B, B is the third one. So I'm going to take the first two values and I'm going to take those to 0.25. And now you can see the effect that that has is that the B channel is the one that's having the full scattering distance and we're attenuating red and green to quite a degree. So we have a much stronger blue effect to the subsurface scattering. Now let's say that we want one centimeter to be our depth, but I'm in Imperial. I could simply come in here and type one CM and it would convert that into the equivalent Imperial value. It's so much easier and more logical to work with because it's in your scene scale now. So for instance, if we came up to base color, let's drive this more into like an orange color, but we obvi obviously have this really strong blue shift going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take red, drive that back up to one, take blue down to a quarter. Now it's a little bit too red. So I'll come back up to green and put that up to 0 0.5 to balance that out. So it's pretty easy to work with once you kind of understand what's happening. So finally, we could come down to our subsurface slider and maybe just drop it back a little bit so the effect isn't quite as strong. And we end up with something that looks a little bit like caramel. So let's come in now. I'm going to turn off subsurface scattering. I'm going to neutralize this color and we're going to turn on sort of a cloth sim that I did just for materials that you may want to use that are representational of cloth. And we're going to look at the new sheen model. So if we come down to the bottom, there's a new sheen function. The new sheen mechanism replaces what was in Blender 3.6, and it is a more robust mechanism for handling sheen types of effects. And it's based on a paper called Practical Multi-Scattering Sheen Using Linearly Transformed Cosines. <laughs> In essence, what it does is it looks at the fact that there would be very, very small scale fibers that are aligned to the normal of the surface. So if you just take any surface and you think of a normal, which is a 90 degree relationship to any point on that surface, and then you have lots and lots of little, very fine fibers coming out at that relationship to the surface, light would scatter and bounce around those fibers and light wouldn't so much be interacting with the surface itself as much as it is with all of that mass of fibers. And that's what this paper is replicating. So let's take a look at basically kind of how it operates. What I will do is come up to the base color. I'm going to set that to black. Now let's come back down to sheen tint and you can see that I've already got this pink color, which will really help to emphasize it. So the sheen mechanism is pretty simple in terms of parameters. It's got a roughness parameter and it's got a sheen intensity parameter. So this sheen intensity parameter is very much like the one for anisotropy. It's a scalar function. And so let's go ahead and just turn it up to 1.0, which is its default max strength, even though you can go above 1.0. We'll take a look at that in a bit. So if we take sheen roughness and let's set it to 0 0.2, you get to see a little bit of the effect, but it's still pretty minor. So let's take it to 0 0.3 and there we're beginning to see it. 0 0.4. Oh, look at that. That's cool. And then 0 0.5. And now it's really beginning to appear to give, give it sort of that velvety appearance. In fact, in Blender 4.0, the old velvet node has been replaced by the sheen node, which has both the old algorithm and the new algorithm. But in the principled BSDF, it only contains the new microfiber sheen function. So you really sort of want to think about using the sheen in one of two ways, where you want the sheen parameter to represent the entirety of the surface. It can also be used to represent dust on a surface if you want to make it just white. The other way is to use it in conjunction with the base color, where it's, it acts as sort of an emphasis sitting on top of the base color. So if we come back over to the sheen roughness and we continue to increase it, its strength increases. And you could see, you could use that entirely for the surface. But the other way that we could use this, let's take sheen roughness all the way down and let's take sheen strength all the way down. And we'll come back up to the base color 
and we'll assign the base color to sort of a strong blue. Bring its intensity up just a little bit. So then we could come back down to sheen and we could think about adding to that as sort of an emphasis. So I would come back up to sheen strength. It's not going to show what well, we have roughness set to zero. But now when I take the strength up, you can begin to see the effect of the sheen sitting on top of that base color. So this is where you would say, well, I want my base color to drive the overall appearance of the surface, but I want that sheen to add sort of that glancing angle satin type of effect. So I mentioned that you could take sheen above 1.0. So let's say that we left the roughness where it is, but I took sheen roughness and took it up to four. And you can see that really gives a strong effect for that satin silky type of appearance. Another way that we could use this would be to create a kind of a taffeta type of material that has a very strong metallic feeling to it, that has a kind of iridescence property. So in this particular case, let's turn back on the interactive renderer. We're going to come back and use the method where we use the base color as the underlying driver of the surface. But in this case, we want to take it and shift it up towards metallic mode. But I don't want it to go quite all the way. And what that'll do is it'll render a fully diffuse component and a fully metallic component and blend them together. Now we can come down to sheen. Let's turn sheen all the way up. Let's start bringing up the roughness. We can begin to introduce that kind of iridescence that you would see on some of these taffeta types of materials. I think perhaps that's a little bit too strong. So I'm going to come over and reduce the saturation a little bit. Yeah, I like that. That's very kind of taffeta-like, and you could play with different colors. But this is just another way that you could use the sheen function. So this is where we could take a look at the two different general formation approaches to the surface for the fabric. In this particular case, I'm going to let sheen do all the heavy lifting to represent the surface. And we're going to start out with this seat having a sheen roughness value of zero. The sheen intensity is set up to 1.0, but as long as roughness is down at zero, you're not going to see anything. So we're going to gradually increase in 0.1 increments. So we're going to go to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 roughness, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0 roughness. So sheen is able to represent that surface entirely by itself. But the other approach is to let the base color be the core driver of the surface, and then you add sheen on top of that. So here we have sheen set to 1.0, but roughness is zero, so we're not seeing the effect yet. So now when we set roughness up to 0.1, we get this, we don't see much yet. 0.2 roughness, we don't see much yet. 0.3, we begin to see it. 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0 roughness. So you can use sheen as sort of an additive or emphasis effect to the base color.